Ms. Starla Lewis is a professor emeritus, transformational speaker, and life coach who lectures and facilitates training on diversity, life mastery, and women's empowerment. She is the founder of CELL, Celebration of Everlasting Life and Love Consulting. Her 40 plus years of research and experience in African American studies, oral communications, women's studies, have enhanced her ability to engage diverse communities. She is the author and the illustrator of Sun Kisses, a multicultural and multilingual coloring book for children and adults. She's the co-creator and facilitator of Woman's Worth, Reclaiming Our Divinity and Our Destiny. And her daughters and granddaughters participate with her in that, and it's a powerful experience. And she's also the co-author of I Am My Own Self Validation. Starla is a seven-time recipient of the Mesa College Teacher of the Year Award, a 2015 Women's Hall of Fame honoree, and has been recognized by KPBS as a local hero. She has dedicated her life to teaching people love and life skills. Through her work, she affirms that all people are brilliant, powerful, limitless, and love. Please join me in welcoming my dear friend and one of the stars of our community, Miss Starla Lewis. I don't like being behind a podium. I don't like having space between us because I believe that I am because we are. And we are Therefore, I am. I am humbled and honored to be here today to talk about someone who influenced my life from my childhood. And that is Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I want you to repeat after me. I am Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. You see, we're just divine reflections of one another. And so when we honor him today, we are honoring the best in ourselves. And we have to remind ourselves of what that best is. So I want each of you to close your eyes for just a moment. Mine are open, I got your back. <laughs> and I want you to visualize your beautiful face. And I want you to visualize aging backwards until you see that beautiful little child that lives in you always, that child that is born into the world, that child that has pure spirit, that child that is eager to grow and to learn and to be a part of the world that you're born into. And when you see that image of yourself, I want you to then open your eyes my name is Starla Rosette Lewis. I was born December 20th, 1949 in a colored hospital in Springfield, Missouri. I was born to teenage parents, Rose Carolyn England Lewis and Alan Lee Lewis. I was born one day after Rose's 18th birthday, so I like to think of myself as a belated birthday gift. My grandparents were Rosa Irene Ford England and Guy Littleton England, Alice Lorraine Lewis Nichols Bagley, and an unknown white man. I am the great, great, great niece of Katie Elizabeth White Boyd, who was born in 1880 on a plantation in Missouri. She lived to be 100 years old, so she was my first black studies professor because she was living history. And she did for me what Dr. King did for me. And that is, she reminded me of my value and my worth. I desegregated a school in Missouri when I was five. And when Aunt Kate prepared us to go, she said, child, you're going to have to be your own self-validation. She said, there are going to be some white people there 
who don't want you there. And they don't want to see you do well. She said, some of them will do it out of meanness, but most of them will do it out of ignorance because they don't know who you are. It was like armor. She said, you are not to hate them because hate only destroys the hater. She said, you must treat all people the way you want to be treated. And so that's how I learned to maneuver through desegregating a school in Springfield, Missouri. One of my best friends was a little girl by the name of Cheryl Brown. Cheryl Brown was the younger sister of Linda Brown of Brown versus the Board of Education, Topeka, Kansas. They were ran out of Topeka, Kansas after that landmark decision and they ended up in Springfield, Missouri. Her mother was the first woman I had ever seen wear a wig because the stress of participating in that landmark decision had her lose all her hair. Why am I sharing this with you? Because we are living history. We know people and we know people who made history and are making history and we are making history with them and we take it, so much of it for granted. Because of segregation in Missouri, my parents had to move uh, to find work. So that's how I ended up in California, Pasadena, California to be specific. And I, one of my honors that I'm going to share with you today is I actually am in my John Muir High School Hall of Fame along with Jackie Robinson, I'm just saying. <laughs> And when we moved to California, I desegregated a school in Altadena when I was nine. It's important that we tell our stories because if we don't tell our stories, then we don't prepare our children to live in their world. It was in Altadena, California that I had an amazing experience in school desegregation. I'm sitting in my classroom, the teacher is explaining that we're going to be talking about our ancestors and where they came from. And it was in that classroom, being the only African American child in the school, where I discovered, and as we all know, Starla's ancestors came from Africa. And Starla went, Rrr. <laughs> because no one had ever told me that. I went home, I said, Mom, did you know that we came from Africa? She goes, Rrr. <laughs> And he said, well, yeah, but we don't know anything about Africa. It was a long, long time ago. I said, well, can I call Aunt Kate, 1880? And so I did, and I said, Aunt Kate, did you know that we're from Africa? And she said, oh, yeah, baby, my daddy came over on the boat. I was like, what boat? We have to be teaching truth to children. I want to... Thank you. I want to dedicate my presentation today to the children because it was as a child that I learned to love myself. It was as a child I learned to see myself. It was a child that I learned to accept myself because I was always told I was good enough. You know, um, I'm blocking on her name. Uh, Toni Morrison says that when a child walks into a room, all the adults should light up. Are we lighting up for our children? When we send our children to school because we have desegregated them, are we comfortable with the fact that we have not desegregated the curriculum? The purpose of education is knowledge of self. It's knowledge of self. On the first day of school, I say to my students, I teach because I love you. And I'm here because I love you. And some people have a hard time believing that. But when you love yourself, you love everybody. Because they are just a reflection of you. 
And we're not being taught that. We're not taught how to see ourselves in one another. We need knowledge and information like Dr. King had. We have to be truth seekers. He was a man of truth. We have to acknowledge that our goal is peace. And you can't get to peace without going through love. Because where there is no love, there is no peace, personal or collective. And Dr. King believed in justice. You know, when I hear our, our people in power talking about law and order, I realize they don't understand justice. Because Dr. King went to jail a lot of times. He had long stints in jail. He had to have intervention from presidents of the United States to get out of jail card. Why? Because he broke the law. Because the law was out of order. We are in a time that demands truth because the illusions have confused us all. And what I mean by a time that demands truth, we have to tell our children that yes, we have made great strides, but you have a bigger job to do because you have to transcend the illusions. Dr. King was not a dreamer, he was a visionary. It's important to understand the difference. He was a man who could see the possibilities of us becoming our best selves and living our best lives. Because until you get in touch with yourself, do you understand that everything that we see is a, a manifestation of our collective consciousness? Where are we? How do I love myself? I'm sitting at, a, at San Diego State University in a room full of beautiful, young African-Americans. And the question they asked us was, how do you love yourself? And from there, it went into conversations around suicide and drug use and all those things that we call the problem, which is the symptom of the problem. The problem is we have to love ourselves, and in loving ourselves, then we do what is in our best interest. In my classes, I had one rule. I only had one rule, and it was respect yourself. And why was that one rule so important? Because if you respect yourself, I get automatically respected. Do you understand? It's not about me, my ego, who I am. It's about we. And we have to see ourselves in one another. We have to not be afraid of speaking truth. And we have to not be afraid of speaking truth to power. Dr. King wasn't. What is the truth? The truth is racism is, period. The truth is sexism is, period. The truth is classism is, period. And if we don't start acknowledging these isms that are the problems behind so many of our symptoms, then how do we begin to transcend it as a nation, as a people? How do we begin to be who we really are? How do we become our best selves? Our children are in crisis. And they're in crisis no matter what their economic level. Our children are in crisis. And it doesn't matter just that you love them. You got to teach them how to love themselves. And you have to get them to understand that no one comes from nothing. We are all from the divine. And as we are born into the world, whatever circumstances, we have the genius, the brilliance, the gifts, the talents to transcend those circumstances. We need to understand that, and we need to teach that, and we need to model that, and we need to show that. And we have to be in the world, but we don't have to be of it. We don't have to say, well, that's what everybody does. 
You know, I had a party once. It was a non-alcoholic party, and on the invitation it said, don't bring your own bottle. <laughs> because our children need to see us having fun sober, too. See, if they see us having fun sober, then they understand it's an option. But if they think every time we show up to play, we have to have a substance to play with, then why do we are so surprised to see our children in the state they're in? See, we're the role models. <laughs> Dr. King was an amazing role model for us. He spoke truth. He encouraged us to seek truth. He had the courage to stand in truth. That's not easy to do in the world that we live in. That you get punished when you stand in your truth. You get ostracized when you speak up. You get labeled. But Aunt Kate said to me, child, you got to be your own self-validation. You got to be your own self-validation. See, our children are screaming at us. They're screaming at us through their drug use. They're screaming at us through their out of order sexual behavior. They're screaming at us through our, their apathy. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be in school. I don't want to do this. And the reality is Dr. King, when he was 15 years old, spoke on it. He said the education system isn't educating. I have a brilliant granddaughter. I just want to tell you. She's just brilliant born nun. And I can't help but acknowledge her because I can remember when she said to me how much she hated school. And I said, well, why do you hate it? She said, I'm spending hours and hours and hours of my life on random information. The information that our children learn in school are supposed to help them connect the dots. I am math. I am language. I am oral communication. I am science. When I walk out of a classroom, I need to know how that information is me and how I can use it in my world. You see, it's not hard to teach. I never planned to be a teacher. I fell into it because I fell into black studies. And I fell into black studies learning about myself, and I said, this is the information I had needed as a child in order to understand why I'm not inferior. I didn't believe I was, but I had no ammunition to deal with all the messages society was sending me. And I've taught it for over 40 years. And I taught it when my counselor said, you don't want to major in that. What are you going to do with a degree in black studies? And I taught it even when my father said, and I quote, excuse my French, that black shit ain't never going to get you nothing. And I taught it even when my black studies professor said, you might want to major in something more traditional like psychology. You're really good with people. And I have taught it for these years. And my daughter told me I've taught over 17,000 people. And many of them are still in my life. And I watched children. Oh, and I also have to say this. And my first black studies class was in Palomar College in 1974, which means when I walked in there, there were no black people. <laughs> Why am I sharing this with you? Because Dr. King spoke to everybody. When you're speaking truth, we're hungry for it because we've been fed so much illusion. So when you're speaking truth, Anybody who's human is looking for it. They want it. They seek it. I have students of every ethnicity say to me, I have learned more about myself in your class than any class I've ever taken. Why? Because we're not just talking about individuals. We're talking about our collective self. I am because we are. And when we understand it, then we stop thinking, well, is it okay for white people to take black studies? I said, well, when I first started teaching, that's all I had. 
I had a beautiful young blonde girl come up to me after a class. She said, thank you so much for this class. She had long hair and it was very curly. And she said, I learned to love myself in this class because I've never liked my hair. I had a mother run up to me at the mayor's office, actually. And she said, she hugged me and I thought I should know who this is because she is hugging me, you know. And she said, my, you, you don't know me. That was a relief, you know. <laughs> she said, my daughter took your class, and she learned to love herself, and she learned to love her hair, and she learned to love her skin, and she got off drugs. You see, the, the symptoms, the issues where we're putting our time and our money, that's not where the problem is. In our health community, we're talking about ACEs, and we're talking about all this trauma. Do you understand racism is traumatic for children? Do you understand that sexism is traumatic for your daughters? Do you understand that classism is traumatic not only for the child who is in the poverty, but the child who's affluent? I just had one of my affluent friends share that her son said, my school did not prepare me to deal with my world. I didn't know that there were people in college who were homeless. I didn't know that there were people in college who were hungry. Do you understand? We've got to teach the truth. And then we have to understand that we all, as Dr. Martin Luther King so ably told us, we are all servants. We're just here to serve. No matter what your ego is telling you, you are a servant. And you are here to serve. And if we help one another, if we serve one another, if we reach out and support one another, what a peaceful, loving world we will live in. You see, we don't, thank you. <laughs> Dr. King believed that love was the most powerful force in the universe. He believed that love was God. He believed that if we lead with love and live with love, that it would be transformational, not only to those that we love, but to those that we struggle to love. And in, in his speech, you got to love your enemy. He says, I don't mean an affectionate love. You, got this, you can't always like your enemy. They may be hurting you, but you want to accept their right to be, their right to exist on the planet because that's what you want for yourself. You see, you have to give what you want. And if you want to be loved, then you have to be loved. Does this make sense? If you want to be loved, be it. It'd be like a love magnet, you know? I turned 70 this year. And 195 people who loved me showed up. And they showed up from my childhood. They showed up from my students. I had a student flying from New York. She's a minister now. And she talked about feeling love. When you have it, you give it. And when you give it, it transforms those around you. Why was I teacher of the year seven times? Because the first day of class, I tell my students, I teach because I love you. And you may not believe it today, but by the time you leave this class, you'll know it's true. My classes, I've never had an issue with civility. Why? Because I treat them with respect. I treat them civilly. Why do you want something from people you're not willing to give them? Do you understand? Why do you want something that you're not willing to give them? You are love. You're the thing itself. You're the thing itself. And once you know that, you don't seek it, it, it seeks you. Does that make sense? Everybody's out there looking for love, looking for love, looking for love, and you're not even being loving. You're not even being your lovable self. You got all these walls and all this protection. We have to see each other. We have to learn about each other. I challenge our educational system, every level, including college, 
to teach our next generation who Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was and the legacy, the words, the wisdom, the values, the moral consciousness that he left us. Because I'm telling you, I'm sitting in front of classrooms in San Diego State and different places, and I'll ask my students, who was Dr. Martin Luther King? And they tell me he had a dream. They don't know what the dream was. They don't know why he was dreaming it. They just, he had one. That's not enough information. We have to teach the legacy. We have lived it. It was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who helped me be that little black girl desegregating that school in Altadena, California. Because I would watch the civil rights movement on TV and I knew that someone was speaking on my behalf. It was that little black girl who went to high school, John Muir High, Pasadena, California. They made a documentary on my high school because so many different ethnicities went to that high school and we got along. I took my granddaughter to my high school reunion. She was about, I think, six or seven. After the drum line played, she said to me, Goomba, that's what she calls me. She said, Goomba, thank you so much for bringing me here. This was one of the best days of my life. Who says that at a high school reunion? <laughs> what did she witness? She witnessed people of all ethnicities interacting, hugging, talking, and it was genuine. I grew up like that because great, great, great Aunt Kay said, teach people the way you want to be treated. And when you give love, trust me, it is transformational for all who are in the presence of it. You may not ever know it, you may ever not, not see it, you may not have a conversation with it, but we are love, people. We are the thing itself, and our fear gets in our way. So courage is what Dr. Martin Luther King demonstrated for us. And overcoming fear, fear is false evidence appearing real. Worry is all those things you're concerned about that never happened and probably won't. All the time and energy we, we spend being afraid, when in reality, we are more than enough. In reality, we are more than worthy. In reality, we are magnificent beyond our imagination. We say we're believers, we say we come from the creator, we say that we are children of God. And yet we act like we're not. We act like we're not divinely made. We act like we're not brilliant, born that way with many gifts and talent. We act like we're not powerful, that we don't have the ability to make those choices that are in our best interest. We act like we're not limitless, multi-talented, multi-faceted, creativity spews from us. We act like we are not love. And so we don't love one another. We don't accept one another. We don't elevate one another. And we're divine ref reflections of one another. I want to close by asking you to do something. I want you to repeat after me. I am brilliant. I am powerful. I am limitless. I am love. And this is important. This came to me while speaking to 500 incarcerated youth at Claremont Juvenile Facility. And when I spoke these words to them, and they spoke those words back to me, as I moved through life, I would run into one of them. When I ran into City College, he was a Latino, stepped out of the shadows, had on the khaki pants, the big shirt, you know. He said, I was in Claremont Juvenile Facility. I said, I'm glad you're out. He said, we listened to you. We talked about what you had to say, how we're the same people, how we're all connected. 
I was at City College. I was subbing. I saw a young African-American male running through the cafeteria. He yells out, sister, sister, I'm in the positive. Because I told them anything you can do in the negative, you can do in the positive, and you can get out and stay out. I was standing in a line in a bank, and I heard this Latino woman say, that's her, that's her. And I looked around, because I'm nosy. That's why I know stuff, because I'm nosy. And a young girl was standing there, and her mother came up to me, and she said, I don't know what you said to my daughter, but she was in Claremont Juvenile Facility. And whatever you said, she has really changed her life. We're not here to change each other. We're here to share with one another. We're here to give people whatever tools that we have been given to help them make better choices in their own lives. I can't change you. I can't change my children. Boy, was I free when I figured that out. <laughs> but what I can tell you is that if we send out love, if we just keep sending it out, from the heart of the heart, we will see change, and we will see peace, and then we will have the home, because it will be global. Wherever we go on the planet, we will understand it's home, because we are the same people. I am, because we are, we are, therefore I am. See yourself love yourself, and be your own self-validation. So powerful, I have to say. I want to thank you again, Starla, for sharing your life's history and for sharing your road to what has brought you here today. I think um, I was touched by a lot of things that you said. Um, and this table here and a lot of people in this room hold a lot of history, more history than you're going to learn in school. And it's, and it's always good to share that. Um, as I look around the room, there's elected officials here, uh, there's appointed officials. Uh, I also see our law enforcement here, and I'm sure there's some fired people and whatnot. And what I got out of your speech today was, number one, be your own self-validation. Number two, I heard truth a lot. And number three, I heard love a lot. And number four, I heard justice. So we live in a world that's not perfect and things are gonna happen. So your words to me today is helping me in my evolution to be a better person. There was a time where love and compassion wasn't on the top of my list. It was more about getting ahead. And I blame coming from a small town in Mississippi on that. And I, I didn't know that we were all in this together and it was global. And you had, to have share, you had to share love in order to get it. So thank you again for helping me and my evolution. So as things happen when you leave here today, things are going to happen. But what I asked you to do, and I think what she's asking you to do, and I think what the Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. would want us to do is approach them with truth, love, and justice in mind. That's what I asked you to do. So when things arrive, you approach them with truth, justice, and love in mind, and hopefully we will come to a great resolution on that. 